Good morning, everyone. My name is Janine Morales, and I go by she, her. My relationship to the organization is a board member of the ACLU, and um, I am also the deputy director at Nero Pro Choice Oregon. This, is a, this event is recorded and will be available on our website later this evening. Please feel free to share with friends and family. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our captioner, Julene Bahadi, the Bahada, sorry, from LNS Captioning, and our ASL interpreters, Christina Healy and Elise Mungian. If you prefer to have an interpreter's windows large and the rest of participants' windows much smaller, you can use the pin feature to keep one window larger than the rest. Today, many of us are located on the traditional village sites of Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapua, Mulalala, and other indigenous nations. We pay our respects to our elders, past and present, who have stewarded this land for generations. Our community agreements. Before we dive in, I'd like to ground us today in group agreements. By participating today, it is our expectation that you will create a space which values and respects differences of race, ethnicity, immigration status, age, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, ability, and socioeconomic circumstance. With each, we'll respect and contribute to the ACLU's culture of belonging by fostering an equitable and inclusive experience in all aspects of community work by centering BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, voices and experiences. This will look like listening to understand, making space for prioritizing oppressed voices, speaking my truth responsibly, taking responsibility for your impact regardless of your intent and for white people and other privileged identities to not put the burden on BIPOC and other oppressed groups to educate you about the harm that your actions and behaviors created. Being willing to do things differently and experience discomfort, seeing discomfort and tension as an opportunity to grow, not a barrier to, to it. Thank you for your willingness to be here with us and honoring this space. Again, I'd like to share with you that my name is Janine Morales. I am the deputy director at NARAL Pro-Choice Oregon. We are focused on ensuring access to all in an equitable and just manner. This political session, we focus on three things, ensuring the Oregon Health Plan can cover all people, regardless of immigration status, expanding childcare for all families facing hardship and the economic downturn, making sure large healthcare mergers and acquisitions put health equity, including access to abortion and gender affirming care before profits. In my current position, I have taken great interest in ensuring there's an equitable lens on maternal and birth mortalities with the black and indigenous women in Oregon. This is an area that has little data and policy that affects these birthing people very differently than white and other dominant cultured residents here in Oregon. Since graduating from Portland State University, I have worked in advocacy for many communities who are often most impacted by policy, foster youth, re-entry from incarceration and second chance individuals, gang impacted, domestic violence victims, Victims at risk of and survivors of sex trafficking, youth and young adults transitioning into adulting, which includes but not limited to post secondary education, vocational training, employment, and supportive wraparound services. These experiences have played a significant role in my development as a policy advocate for them in my current role. Joining the ACLU board has been such an honor. As an Oregonian whose community has dealt with much hate and discrimination since the founding of the state, 
I have found that the ACLU of Oregon has been an ally to my community. They have been pivotal in proactively supporting my people and advancing justice for victims who look like me. As we embark on the 18th year since the untimely and tragic death of Kendra James to supporting Black Lives Matters and justice for George Floyd, I knew that joining a board such as this one would be a great opportunity for me to embrace my community, a resource that values their lives as much as their white community members. Like many others, this is my first year in policy and legislation. In my current position at NARAL and as a board member of ACLU of Oregon, I have learned so much in such a short time while also realizing there are many gaps in equity. There have been times where I wanted to interject and ask questions, but felt unsure of the response I may receive or question the correct way to express my thoughts without making it about me or only my people. There have also been many times when I reviewed a bill and could not see my experiences reflected and question what would truly benefit from the policy and who would continue to be overlooked. Although I'm new to legislation and lobbying, I've come to realize that I am needed in this work. You are actually needed in this work. Together, we bring a human face and the spirit of our community directly to the elected officials, which cannot be ignored. We are needed to push the bills that will impact communities in an equitable manner. Without each of us, many policies can fail in session and lead to communities being failed by systems designed to discriminate and harm them. Much remains uncertain. That's why being here matters. Together, I hope I look back on this first session and see real progress that was made through our collective actions and new friends like all of you who are learning new lessons and looking forward with an even greater determination to impact change. Who's with me? Raise your hands and want to see you all on this journey with me together because anything is possible. I wanna thank you all for your support and encouragement through this process and to focus on the budget and grounding that, the focus and budget on the grounding and that the budget isn't just a bunch of numbers on a page. It's a reflection of the state's values and priorities, dictating who benefits from finite resources and who gets left behind. And we'll do some phone banking before we head into our legislators meeting. Next, we will hear from Sandy Chung, the executive director of the ACLU of Oregon to talk about the Oregon state budget. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to let you know that representative Dan Mayfield he is actually caught up in the Ways and Means Committee, which is the legislator's main committee on budgeting. And so he will actually join me after I do this budget 101 presentation. Oh, um, one second. Okay, um, so can everyone see my screen? Great, perfect. Um, I had actually put on some background filters and so you were able to see that before, but the background filter I'm using today is of Multnomah Falls. So to get started, I would first like to thank the, um, our partners at Four Together, the organization Four Together put together these budget materials and have been training folks at different organizations to provide training about the Oregon State Budget. We also want to thank our partners at the Oregon Center for Public Policy, the Oregon Food Bank, and our allies in the Oregon labor movement who also put this budget presentation together. Originally, this presentation was developed as a two-hour training with opportunities for lots of questions and interactive activities. Today, we've allotted about 30 minutes. 
So we won't have time for direct verbal questions or interactive activities. However, if you have questions, please put your questions in the chat feature and my teammates will either answer questions or we'll save and record the questions and get back to you with responses after the presentation. As we get near the end of the presentation, I may need to go more quickly over some of the sections because I wanna be respectful of our schedule and your time commitment. But if there are any questions you have about sections where I wasn't able to get into more information, please put that in the chat feature and it'll be my pleasure to get back to you. So to get started, I would like to tell you about the values of the ACLU of Oregon related to the state of Oregon's budget. The ACLU of Oregon supports and we center our work on black, indigenous and people of color communities and low income communities. And with our economic justice advocacy efforts, we are really focusing our efforts on supporting BIPOC and low income individuals and communities. In this area of economic justice, we are continuing to listen and learn as we determine how we can best do work in this area. While economic justice is a relatively new advocacy area for the ACLU of Oregon, it's always been a core value of our organization. So what are our values? We value people over profit. We value economic stability for BIPOC, BIWOC, and low-income communities, mothers, and individuals. We value directly investing in BIPOC and low-income community members and BIPOC and low-income-led organizations and communities. We value centering racial justice and budgeting processes and centering racial justice with advocacy related to public and government budgets. Today's training will be broken up into three sections. First, spending. So we'll talk about where the Oregon, um, the state of Oregon spends its money. Second, revenue, the money that the state of Oregon receives to spend. And then third, process and action and how you can get involved in the state of Oregon's budget processes. This is a 30 minute training, but please feel free to take care of yourself throughout it as you need. Okay, let's start with spending. So one is, what is a really important thing that is paid for by the state of Oregon government that you, your family or your community uses? And if you would like, why don't you use the chat feature to share with everyone in this Budget 101 presentation, something really important paid for by the state government that you use, your family uses, or your community uses. We're starting with this question because what the state funds that's important to you, we're gonna be talking about this. And I see one answer from an individual from Bob Parks. Yes, definitely there's um, spending by the state of government that supports our state parks. Roads, yes, another excellent answer. Um, transportation related, the roads, our schools. Kelly, thank you. Public schools by another participant as well. In the state of Oregon, we they fund a bunch of programs that make a huge difference for all of our communities and families. So let's actually look at a pie chart that has this information. This pie chart shows how the state of Oregon spending and budget is broken up. The state of Oregon actually developed state budgets for two year periods. The last one was developed for the period of time from July, 2019 to June, 2021. And the total amount for those two years was about $86 billion. As you can see in this pie chart, the biggest portion went to human services at $35.8 billion. In the chat feature, if you'd like, can you type in some of the programs and services that you think falls under human services? The next biggest portion went to administration at 15 billion. Then if you look at the rest of the pie chart, education is at 9 billion, and there's another education slice at 7 billion, so total 16 billion, economic development at 5.7 billion, public safety and judicial at 5.2 billion, natural resources at 2.1 billion, and then a catch-all, all other category at $5.9 billion.
Let's dive deeper into the education funding part of that pie chart. So in the pie chart, we saw that education consisted of two slices, one at 9 billion, the other at 7 billion. This equals $16 billion. This covers a range of things, everything from funding for our K through 12 public schools in the state of Oregon across the state to specific schools like the Oregon State School for the Deaf, Deaf education for our children and correctional facilities, funding for our public university and community colleges. And one thing I wanna let you know is I work at a community college and I think community colleges are tremendously important to public education. And then many other areas of education relating, related spending as well as set out in this um, PowerPoint slide. Next, let's look at the human services funding part of that pie chart. So human services fund or spending was at 35.8 billion. It was about 41.7% of the state of Oregon's budget for the last two years. Included in this is the Oregon Health Authority, which is the state agency that supports public health across Oregon, as well as funding for the 34 public health departments across Oregon. Now with COVID-19, we saw how just incredibly important the work of our public health agencies are to the health and safety of Oregonians. You know, I'd be the first to say Oregon's COVID efforts were not perfect. However, I can also say that our state made a tremendous effort. And if you actually look at the per capita death rates for states across the United States, Oregon was much lower than many other states. And I think it's because of the commitment of the Oregon Health Authority and our public health agencies across the state of Oregon. Another area that's funded by human services is the Oregon Health Plan, which is the state's medical plan that services one in four Oregonians. So 25% of Oregonians are supported by the Oregon Health Plan. Another health plan supported by human services funding is Cover All Kids a health plan that covers low-income Oregonians and kids, regardless of immigration status. Other areas that are funded by this area include things like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, an important food support and resource program, as well as support for 11,000 children in foster care in Oregon, as well as other programs like vocational rehabilitation for folks of varying abilities, as well as health insurance for all of Oregon's public employees. Next, let's look at the natural resources funding, spending of the state. This covers things in food safety and consumer protection, as well as environmental protection and quality. One of the agencies that you may be most familiar with is DEQ, because we have to take in our cars to be checked every couple of years to make sure that our cars are not producing small creating pollut pollutants. Another area that's funded here is our agencies and departments that work with fisheries and wildlife conservation. Did you know that our state fisheries programs actually um, stocks our lakes and ponds across the state of Oregon, including in lakes and ponds close to urban communities with trout so that we can take our kids fishing and also to promote eco-business and tur tourism across Oregon. This is one area I've definitely benefited because I've taken my son Luke, who's eight, uh, fishing at our local pond. Although as of yet, we have not caught anything, but we've seen other people catch trout in this pond near our home. Let's go on to economic and community development. So this area of the pie chart was at 5.7 billion. One of the really important areas that's funded here is unemployment insurance. Have any of you had experience with unemployment insurance? I definitely have. Before joining the ACLU of Oregon, I was the Vice President for Human Resources at the University of Portland, and we had more than a thousand employees. Now during fall of 2020, because of the COVID pandemic, we were not able to fully reopen campus. And this meant we had a significant drop in revenues. And so because of the situation, we had to put some staff employees on furloughs. However, 
we actually were able to work with the state unemployment office so that we could sign up our employees on furloughs and they could recover some of the lost wages through the unemployment insurance program. So this was an incredibly important program and um, a program that I'm very grateful for in the state of Oregon. Other areas covered by economic and community development include areas such as the Oregon Cultural Trust and housing support programs and housing support. Another program area we've seen is incredibly important during the pandemic, as well as before. Now let's look at the spending lines for public safety and judicial funding. So in the pie chart, that was at 5.3 billion. That funds everything from our state courts to the state's Oregon Youth Authority, which is the correctional system for youth, um, as well as Oregon's Department of Corrections. It also covers things like Oregon State Police, funding for district attorney's offices across Oregon, as well as funding for crime victim survivor services. And I know having previously worked with the survivors of sexual assaults, that these services are really, really important for crime victims and survivors. So let's discuss some of the spending takeaways, some of the things we've learned by looking at how the state of Oregon spends its money. First, we've seen that the state of Oregon and how it spends its money, there are many services that really support vulnerable Oregonians. In fact, this makes up about 40% of Oregon's budget. In fact, more than 40%. For example, the Oregon Health Plan, which is the insurance program that covers one in four Oregonians and education for you know, state schools, state funded schools, these are the top two places that Oregon spends its money. Second, we see that the state budget really supports the workforce of our state in a wide range of ways, from directly employing Oregonians in good public sector jobs to supporting businesses and other types of tourism and business generation in Oregon to supporting programs like unemployment insurance. Third, the state's budget shows that Oregon really values public service and public employees both with good health care for employees, retirement services, and good public sector jobs. One note I wanted to make here is we've really seen and learned a lot from the COVID pandemic. The pandemic showed us that when a state doesn't properly resource public services like health insurance or public health agencies, this can result in real harm to individuals and communities. So it is vitally important that a state budget reflect our community's values. Next, let's talk about the revenue, the monies that the state of Oregon generates. So this is a pie chart with the main areas in which the state of Oregon receives monies. So we receive as a state federal funds of about $24.2 billion, and this is going backwards, looking backwards, general funding at 22.4 billion, lottery funds at 1.2 billion, and other funds at 37.9 billion. A note I wanted to make here is that a lot of these bucket areas of revenue have restrictions on how they can be spent. For example, if you look at the federal monies that we receive, they have a lot of restrictions. If we receive monies from the federal government as a state, for healthcare spending, we have to spend it on healthcare. If we receive federal funding for education, it has to be spent on education. And the other category, the other funds, the types of funding that go in here, the types of revenue, include things like vehicle license fees to fuel taxes to unemployment related um, taxes that are paid. Again, a lot of these monies have to go specifically to specific programs. For example, monies from vehicle taxes, vehicle licenses and fuel taxes have to be spent to repair roads and highways. That money can't be spent on education. So the state actually has the most flexibility with the general fund line, which is at 26.1% of the budget. Let's look at where we get um, 
you know, our tax revenue is from. So 89% is from personal income taxes, corporate income taxes is 5%, and then all other taxes and lottery is at 5%. So what do you notice about this? I was actually surprised myself because I, I thought this doesn't make any sense that individuals and families are paying 89% of the taxes in the state of Oregon compared to 5% um, for corporations and businesses. Now, in looking at these types of taxes, I have a question for you. Do you think that Oregon's tax policies are race neutral? As an organization that is committed to racial justice, we always try our hardest to make sure that we're using a racial lens and other lenses related to the experiences of BIPOC and other marginalized communities in doing analyses and understanding how our systems work. So I wanna share with you some history from the state of Oregon. This is a law from Oregon's history from 1862. And, um, so one thing I wanted to note before I continue with this slide, I'm getting a note that says Representative Rayfield can join us at about 940. So I, may, I will stop my presentation then so that Representative Rayfield can speak to you. But here, so this is a law from Oregon's history from 1862. And you can see that race has been baked into tax policy since the beginning of Oregon's history. Here, there's a line that says, each and every Negro, Chinaman, Kanaka, and Mulatto residing within the limits of the state shall pay an annual poll tax of $5. $5 today would be, $5 then would be about $150 today. This was Oregon law. So the folks who were unable, the BIPOC folks who were unable to pay this $5, which is $150 today, they had to perform road maintenance. So basically they had to be indentured servants for the state based on their BIPOC status. This is an example of an exclusionary law that the Oregon Territory and the state of Oregon had enacted. But this is not the only type of law that the state of Oregon had related to race. If you actually look at the history of the United States and tax policies, one sees that many tax policies were developed to reinforce and codify white supremacy. For example, the first property tax limit was passed in Alabama in 1875, and it was actually done as a way to protect white property owners. White property owners were afraid that if black folks in Alabama, you know, because this was after the Civil War and was during Reconstruction, if black folks could vote and return to power, white folks were afraid that the black folks would increase property taxes so that they could fund education and other services. So they actually passed limits on property taxes as a way to try to prevent that. Or let's look at in 1932 in Mississippi, the establishment of the first modern sales tax. What happened in Mississippi is by instituting the sales tax, they were able to lower property taxes, but this predominantly benefited white property owners. Right, because property taxes could be lowered because the sales tax was paid by everyone, including black households who owned little or no property at that time. Today, tax policies benefit white Oregonians even when race isn't mentioned. For example, the mortgage interest deduction only offers a tax break to homeowners, not renters. Because of the way the mortgage interest deduction is structured, its biggest tax benefits go, up, go to the most well-off homeowners, the exact folks who need the least amount of help. Next, let's look at how um, we can you know, raise revenue, raise or increase the amount of revenue that can be raised by the state of Oregon. There's two ways to do this. One, Oregonians can vote on it as a ballot measure, or two, the state legislature can uh, vote on increasing revenue. In order to pass a bill that raises revenue, three-fifths of the Oregon Senate and three-fifths of the Oregon House have to vote to approve it. Three-fifths in this way for both the Oregon House and Senate, it's called a supermajority. 
Now there are 60 members of the House, so a super majority is 36 votes. And for the Senate, there are 30 members, so there would need to be 18 yes votes to pass a bill that raises revenue. The point of the supermajority requirement is to make it harder to raise new taxes um, or to pass new taxes. And this can be a real obstacle to raising enough money to fund all of the services that Oregonians need. If a bill gets the votes of supermajority in both the House and Senate, then it heads to the governor's desk where it's signed. And once that's done, then the state's Department of Revenue can collect the taxes and it can be used to fund services. Now, I wanna be clear about this again, returning to the systems and history of white supremacy in the United States, the supermajority requirement again, has its roots in post-reconstruction Mississippi. After the Civil War, wealthy white landowners in Mississippi demanded and won a constitutional requirement for a three-fifth vote in the House and Senate for all state tax increases in Mississippi. And they did this because they were again afraid of black voters. And so they wanted to make it extra hard for there to be any approvals to basically taxation. So we really have to understand the supermajority requirement as one that was instituted to really codify the power of wealthy white plantation owners so that they could preserve their privileges. And so fast forward 100 years in Oregon, and in Oregon, the supermajority requirement for revenue bills was passed in the late 1990s. And the outcome of this bill has been, it's been very hard to raise the monies we need in Oregon to make sure that our programs and services, especially for our most vulnerable communities, are funded appropriately. As part of our discussion about revenue in Oregon, I wanna discuss with you property taxes. So if you look at, for example, 2016, Oregon got 0.2% of its state revenues for state budget from property taxes, while the state of Washington got 9.3% of its money from property taxes. So this is a big discrepancy, so we have to ask why. Well, this is rooted in Oregon's history, specific the 1990s, um, when there are several ballot measures passed to limit the increases that we could do with property taxes. So first there was ballot measure five, which limited the property tax rate at 1.5% of assessed value. And then said, okay, state, um, because we're limiting property taxes, if our schools lose revenue because of this law, then you just have to make up for the money. But if you say just make up for the money, the question is, if you don't have another source, how do you make that money up? Before ballot measure five, local property taxes pay for approximately 70% of each school district's operating costs across the state of Oregon, with 30% coming from the state of Oregon. Today, it's a reverse with the state's general fund dollars making up about 70% of the operating funds for schools. And I wanna remind you to earlier in this presentation, when we discussed that the part of the pie chart, the revenue pie chart that has the least restrictions is the general funds. But most of the other parts of the state's revenues there are you know, restrictions, so we can't just spend it on education. Now, after ballot measure five, then measures 47 and 50 were enacted. And again, those limited how property taxes could basically be applied. So what was the result of these laws to Oregon's property taxes? Oregon simply has not had, had enough money to fund schools. For example, after measure five, we saw these types of impacts. By 2003, uh, um, area like Hillsboro, they had cut their school days by 17 days for the school year. And in Oregon, class sizes grew to be amongst the largest in the country. And schools, our schools, lost critical programs and staff from librarians to music programs to mental health counselors. And over 20 years since the passage of Measure 5, Oregon's high school graduation rate has fallen to one of the lowest in the country. Now, 
There's another way in which Oregon's property tax system has resulted in equity. I want you to consider a situation where, where there are two newly built houses coming onto the market in two neighborhoods, right? And so to start, they both have a similar market rate, the rate you would get if you sold the home, as well as assessed value, which is the value assessed by the state of Oregon. And that's the basis for the property tax. So at the beginning, the owners of these two homes are paying similar property taxes. Now, let's say one of the homes is in a neighborhood that becomes more tre trendy, it's becoming gentrified, while the other home is in an area where it's not considered so trendy or fashionable. And so this is what happens. In the trendier neighborhood, the house there increases in value and how much you can get when you sell it. And so more people start moving in, especially wealthier white families, where in the other neighborhood, that's not considered so trendy, house prices are not increasing so much. However, because there are limits on property tax increases and it doesn't reflect the actual market price of a home, property taxes being paid by the owners of homes in both of those neighborhoods, they remain about the same. What does this mean? It means that even if you're a wealthier and oftentimes white family living in a trendier neighborhood with much higher home values, you're paying the same or similar property taxes as homeowners in other neighborhoods um, where you know, families have lower incomes and lower resources, monetary resources. Okay, here, so I'm going to end um, and then we'll pick up afterwards and we'll discuss the kicker, but um, I'm gonna end now so that if Representative Raphael can join us, he can um, speak to you as part of our lobby days. So everyone, I want to let you know that Representative Rayfield isn't quite here with us, but we can take a little bit of a break. Um, but I ask you to take a break, but be near your computer. So um, you can be here because Representative Rayfield will be joining us shortly. Thank you so much for your patience.
so quiet. Well, Representative Rayfield, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are so excited to have you here today. If you want to start and speak to the ACLU of Oregon community members who are here, um, we would love to hear you. Well, absolutely. And so I, um, I, what I, and I, I'm not sure what, what has gone on so far today. Um, today, we had Janine Morales, one of our board members, and the deputy director at NARA Oregon speak to us. I've also been doing a budget one-on-one -on -one presentation so that the folks here can learn about where the state of Oregon spends its money. And we've also been now talking about the areas in which the state of Oregon gets revenues. And then we'll be talking about the ways in which folks can participate in the budget process, including at the Ways and Means Committee roadshows, which I was really excited to participate in about two weeks ago. Absolutely. Well, thanks. Thank you for having me. I guess um, for those of you that, that don't know me, my name is Dan Rayfield. Uh, I am a, the state representative from the Corvallis, Philomath area, uh, and I serve in the uh, legislature in, and my primary focus is in the Ways and Means Committee. So I am the co-chair for the House side of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, and I think the way to think about, um, and, and Cindy, you probably talked a little bit about this. Um, the way we think of it, we have this very broad, what we call our big committee, if you will, our full committee, and then we have subcommittees. Uh, and when we're trying, you know, in these budgets, what we do is we set all of the agency budgets first um, in a legislative session, and then we start looking at policy bills that might come through uh, the legislative process uh, that has fiscal impacts uh, to agencies, or it might be a direct allocation somewhere. One of the other things that the Ways and Means Committee does, and again, some of you probably already know this, um, it focuses on uh, putting out, uh, whether we're doing direct grants, we're doing capital construction, so we might do bonding uh, for communities, uh, or say local infrastructures for a smaller city that you know doesn't have the taxable base for say a sewer system, um, where the rate increases would be too burdensome for that community. And a whole bunch of other different projects, whether that's university uh, bonding or economic development um, in that space. So it runs the gamut of things. Everything to do with money, frankly, uh, comes through that ways and means process. And, and that's what we're engaged upon right now. Um, really, you know, what we do, um, and, and maybe I, I can tell you a little bit about my journey in this world. Um, I, you know, what I, I think the, the overarching thing is I have, um, you know, they come to this uh, conclusion that the Oregon that we want to see, whether that's in 10 years or 20 years down the road, um, the current revenue that comes into Oregon does not allow us to do a lot of the things that, you know, we would like to do. And it becomes probably one of the most challenging things to sit in this role is to see all of the really good things that we could be doing. Um, but at times we don't have the resources. Um, one of the things, uh, you know, that that is near and dear to a lot of folks heart is to make sure that everyone has health care. Um, and, and we have simple programs in Oregon where we call cover all people, uh, which is a wonderful program this year. Um, but the costs of that are extremely high to do that. And so you find yourselves in these competing and what I would say unwinnable decision points between funding this or funding that. Um, and that presents just an immense challenge, um, you know, you know, morally, but also, um, you know, just internally, it's just very frustrating as you try, um, you know, to move the ball forward towards whatever your collective values are in a, in a given situation. Uh, and when I first came into the legislature, I was fortunate enough to, uh, as a freshman, be the co-chair of the Ways and Means Subcommittee on Natural Resources. And so you have these subcommittees to the full, which really dig into all of the, the different agency uh, pol uh, budgets and also some of the agency or bills or the bills that are related to specific agencies or in that policy area. Uh, and when I first came in, I really had this belief, um, and you make all of these promises when you, uh, on a campaign and say, hey, we're going to fully fund education, um, and everybody defines fully fund differently, by the way, um, or we're going to do this, or we're going to do that, and then you get in, I was super excited to sit on a subcommittee, and frankly, chair a subcommittee as a freshman, and, and very quickly, what you realize um, is that many of our agencies, 
agencies. We operate on a shoestring budget. We are not good employers as a state. Um, you know, and we, and if we look at the way we treat some of our employees, we could do so much better. Um, and the way we do uh, treat our employees, and it. And, and I, I had this vision, like I would come in and it's like, we'll, we'll reappropriate money from one area to another. Um, and yeah, you can find additional money here and there, but it's not the type of big money, right, that provides healthcare to everyone. It's not the type of big money that makes these game changing um, type of investments, say, use higher education, for example, right, where, you know, some of us, you know, would like to see free uh, tuition in higher education, right, or substantially reduced even from where we are now, or fully funding the Oregon Opportunity Grants, right, um, and so, so it becomes this interesting process that we go through every two years, and that's what we're engaged upon right now in setting our budgets, and this year has presented some interesting challenges um, where we had decreased revenues, um, and we came into what we be believed would be a cuts budget, then we had federal money coming in, uh, and what I would say substantial amounts of federal money. Um, but right now we're in this position of where we don't know how we can spend the federal money entirely. We believe it will be flexible, but rules from the treasury will not happen until the end of May. Um, and so we're left in this, what I would say, unpredictable environment while we have a constitutional obligation to balance our budget and be out of the legislative session by the end of June. Uh, and so you can imagine uh, with some of the other political variables of, um, you know, certain chambers want to read the bills in their entirety, which slows the process down, which means we have to start sooner, but we don't get the rules till later and we don't have a May forecast to be able to finalize budget. So there's a lot of what I would say right now, unpredictability um, as we try and finalize some of these base budgets. And so our plan is to kind of move some baseline budgets. And as we know more, start adding to these budgets as time goes on. And I think that's, Sandy, kind of really where it gets into how do people play a role in the budgetary process? Um, and, and how do you have your voice heard when people are making these competing choices, right? Between this or that, or this bill or that bill. Um, how do you have your voice heard in that process? The, the one piece of advice that I always give is A, make a personal relationship um, with your state representative and your state senator. That's the one thing that I would do. And this is a long-term investment, frankly, um, where in session, you may only get 15 minutes with a legislator. And in session, you should be able to meet with your legislator. We're busy, um, but if you, you know, schedule early, at some point as a constituent, you will be able to meet with them. But even better is when you're out of session um, and you email to their office and you say, let's go out to coffee, right? State legislators, and state uh, are the last kind of form of government, frankly, where you can just go out to coffee in your community and talk about your values, build a relationship um, of where you wanna see the state move towards, right? And so that is the first thing that I always kind of recommend. Um, and then when you're in the session, you can talk about a little bit about your priorities. And frankly, a lot of it revolves around what bills do you wanna see move out of ways and means. Um, and part of my responsibility, frankly, is yes, I have my own values and my own vision, but really part of my responsibility is to, in this role, is the entire state, is the, our entire caucus in the House to make sure that those collective values are represented in the budgets that we finally pass out. Um, and I think that is when we have feedback from the community. Um, to individual legislators, those legislators are conduits into this process, um, meeting, um, and then I get that feedback. Um, me, being a part of organizations like the ACLU Oregon, we have meetings and we talk about budgetary priorities. Um, you know, and often I will do meetings before session so I can get oriented about where, you know, various stakeholder groups would like to see their investments placed. So I think being involved in lobby days, being involved in organizations can be helpful, the personal relationships. And then as Sandy mentioned, um, coming to our Ways and Means Roadshows, um, we often will have about 150, 200 people testifying. Uh, and or, or that would like to testify, but especially in this environment, we're unable to get to everyone. Um, so having you know ample amount of folks that are there that could be called on is very helpful as you have all of these competing needs and having your voice heard. I think probably one of the biggest frustrations that I have is there is huge sections of our society that are unconnected with the, an arcane legislative process that don't have their voices heard. And the more that we can connect people in our communities into this, the more that our budgets can reflect the values of the communities we live in, which is, um, is just an 
it's a difficult um, goal to achieve, but it, 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 I think it's an ongoing goal that we try and share. Um, and, it, and you might think to yourself, shoot, Dan, you listen to 60, 70 people on a given night. How does that even impact a budget, right? I am one of many. Um, what I can tell you is I have copious notes um, that go back to the first road shows that I ever did in 2015 um, and things stand out. Um, the folks that are making uh, the decisions in this process listen, uh, and you know, and we go through this process. There, you know, there are I could I could probably top line all of the requests because they all start to fit into categories, right? Um, and and they are impactful, um, and it's helpful because sometimes we don't hear everything, and it's an opportunity to really get a better feel. So uh, I I wouldn't ever um, I, you know the only reason I say it is I had a reporter who tried to discount the value of these hearings. And I said, no, really, genuinely, um, we pay attention, we listen, and it is helpful. But I also want to be cognizant of the fact that there, like I said, there's a large section of our uh, our population, our communities that aren't represented in these meetings, um, frankly, that are just busy, busy with the day to day life and don't have the flexibility to be able to engage. And that's why these hearings are set generally on the weekends or in the evenings, so we can hear from a more broad and diverse group of folks. So. Cindy, I, that was a lot. I may have gone over time, um, but if there are questions, I'd love to be able to answer them or if you have things that would be helpful. Um, Representative Rayfield, thank you so much. That was actually really clear and helpful. As just parting words, um, can you let our you know, membership here who's participating in lobby days, just let them know what you would like to hear from them in the meetings when they meet with legislators? So you know what you can, the things that is very helpful um, is you want to really hit on, you know, the, the budget, the bills that, it, you know, if, so you, you might have some bills, right, that are going to come to the floor, um, to the House floor, the Senate floor. Um, those bills, you know, obviously knowing that there is folks supporting that legislator, if it is a difficult vote, that is always good. Sometimes you only hear the negative, right? Um, and so it's nice to have for a legislator to, to know that they have that community support, right? And that it is coming from their community and not other communities. Um, that's another distinction that we have as legislators. Sometimes we'll get flooded with emails and, you know, we'll, uh, I will always ask, are they from our district? Um, yeah, so it's good to know that. Um, the other connection, if there are bills that are coming down to Ways and Means, um, getting an ally that will then come to their sub, uh, Ways and Means subcommittee chairs, come to the co-chairs of that committee. And often it happens when we're all engaged on the House floor, or now it's a little bit different because we're all socially distanced. Um, but people will come and say, hey, Dan, I got to have this bill out of Ways and Means, and here's why. This is really a priority for me. Um, what I will say behind the scenes when you pull the curtains back, I will tell you that every member has about 40 priorities, um, and it's part of my job is to assess where do these priorities rank for them, right, is we're trying to figure out and balance between this or that. Um, and so I often ask, you know, it's like, hey, you asked me for these other things the other day. Where, where does this fit into that equation? So helping your legislator, um, you know, kind of, prioritize that in their conversations with their budgetary folks is very helpful too. Thank you so much, Representative Rayfield. And thank you just for being a leader in the state of Oregon and making sure that our laws as well as our funding really matches the values of Oregonians. I see Chloe in the chat. Hey, Chloe. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Cindy. Take care. Thank you, Representative. So thank you everyone for um, continuing to be here and listening to Representative Rayfield's thoughts on the state's budget processes. And so I wanted to go on and um, talk to you about another part of the state of Oregon revenues that can, has an equitable application to families and individuals in Oregon. And it's called the kicker. Um, in the chat field, please write if you know what the kicker is. And I actually didn't know about the kicker until really learning about learning this budget presentation and this part of it. Although I have received the kicker before, but I hadn't understood why I was receiving it. But this is how the kicker works. Basically, in putting together a budget for the next two years, the state of Oregon put together projections, estimates about what they think revenues will be. However, if 
what actually happens with the revenues as we go into the time when you know the we're actually in real time if the revenues are more than two percent of what was projected what was estimated then some of those monies have to be returned to organ taxpayers as part of a law that was passed in 1979. So how does that money get passed back to Oregon taxpayers? What we've seen is that with the kicker, the folks who are the most privileged and wealthy in Oregon get the most. So for example, in 2019, the one, top 1% 1 of households averaged $15,000 and the kicker received while the poorest 20% of Oregonians got a kicker of $28. So again, another example of a way in which systemically our tax system is set up to not benefit our low income individuals and communities. So what are some takeaways from this section about revenues in the state of Oregon? First, the state has many sources of income. However, many of those, these buckets of income have restrictions on how they can be used. Second, historically, our tax structure has been borne most heavily by Oregon's families with corporations getting a light or free pass. Third, the current limits on property taxes are inequitable and they hurt our schools and benefits people and families who are wealthier. Fourth, similar to the property tax system, our system of this kicker system also doesn't make sense. And it again, benefits people and families who are wealthier, the people who don't need additional help because they already have more monetary and other financial resources. And then finally, the tax system has been set up this way. The inequity is by design and it's based on race related laws that were passed historically to codify white supremacy. So is there any good news here? Yes. The budget process is a public democratic process. So as ACLU of Oregon community members, we can take our values to the state capitol today virtually, and we can change how the system works so that our families and communities can benefit. So let's talk about the ways in which the state budget process works and how you can participate. And Representative Rayfield actually had spoken to us of ways the system works and how you can participate. But first, the governor receives information from state agencies and the governor puts together um, her budget. As well, um, there are, as part of this process, economic and revenue forecasts that are created and you know, trying to figure out how much money there will be to spend in that two year period for which the budget is being made. The governor puts together her budget but also the legislature through the Ways and Means Committee of which Representative Rayfield is currently a member also develops a budget. And in developing their budget, the Ways and, Ma Ways and Means Committee holds budget hearings in communities so that folks can speak to legislators about Oregonians values and how our budget should reflect those values. As part of the Ways and Means Committee process, there are subcommittees that hold specific budget related hearings that folks can also testify at. And these specific committees cover areas such as education or public safety. After the Ways and Means Committee puts together its budget, it's taken to the Oregon House and Senate for floor votes. And once they pass a budget, then it's sent to the governor to be signed. And after all of this process is done, then the Oregon Department of Revenue can actually start collecting monies and spending the monies in the way that have been budgeted. How can you as Oregonians influence this process? You can do it everywhere in this process. It is a public and democratic process. And so you can attend hearings, write letters or testimony to public officials, engage in lobby days like this, and also, Participate as a member of a group or constituency that has a presence in Salem and works on budget issues. We know that there's a lot about this public process that is, you know, frankly, not so accessible. For example, before the pandemic, 
The hearings were primarily in Salem during the workday. Um, and so that meant, although lobbyists had more access, working families who had jobs, you know, who may not have the time to drive down to Salem had less access. However, there have been efforts to make this process more accessible, for example, by the Ways and Means Committee holding hearings in communities so that folks in communities can speak out. And we've also seen accessibility increase by things like these virtual um, testimony at committees. And so there are ways that I'm hoping that accessibility that we've shown through the pandemic can be kept by the state legislature. As I end this presentation, I wanna to speak to you again about the ACLU of Oregon's values. The ACLU of Oregon is focused on centering our communities that are most disproportionately impacted by harms. And these communities include BIPOC communities, immigrants and refugees, people with varying abilities, the LGBTQ plus community, and folks experiencing poverty and other social and economic injustices. And what we saw through COVID was that oftentimes the communities and families with more resources and privileges and oftentimes wealthy white families, they did better. They had a growth in wealth, including via the stock market. These families were able to pay for private schools and tutoring, and they were to, able to work remotely. Our frontline workers were disproportionately BIPOC and low-income individuals. They were more subject because of being frontline workers to COVID infection, sickness, and death. And it was more difficult for these families to figure out things like caring for their children when our schools closed because of the pandemic. I mentioned all of this because COVID really laid bare that our current systemic inequities result in real harm and death disproportionately for BIPOC and low income communities. And so when I've been speaking to Oregon's legislature legislators about the current bills before them, as well as the budget, I've asked them to make sure that our state decisions, especially our state funding decisions, reflect our values as Oregonians. So these on this slide are bills that we've spoken to you about before and in other materials that are currently pending before Oregon's legislators. You know, they are in the areas of restoration of voting rights, equal access to care, racial and criminal justice, the funding of um, drug addiction treatment and recovery, expungement of criminal convictions, the Oregon Sanctuary Promise Act, which supports immigrants and refugees, and universal legal representation for Oregonians going through deportation proceedings. For the legislator meetings you have today, we've provided you with talking points that covers these legislative priorities. But what we ask is that when you speak to our legislators, you ask them to make sure that they vote for bills and for funding decisions that align with our values in Oregon of fairness, equity, and caring for our most marginalized and vulnerable communities. I wanna thank you so much for participating in this Budget 101 presentation, for participating in our lobby days. We have so much gratitude to you for making sure that our Oregon and our democracy works in ways that are fair, just, and equitable. Thank you, everyone.
Welcome back from break, everyone. I hope this morning has gotten you excited and ready to take some direct action, which is what I'll be speaking to you about for about the next 15 to 20 minutes. My name is Christina Nguyen. I'm the Membership Engagement Officer at the ACLU of Oregon. You might recognize my name because you probably received about 10 emails from me in the last couple of days. Thank you so much for being here and being so engaged. First, I wanna remind you all that the first lobby meeting is at 10.30 for Senator uh, Prezanski. So if I go past 10.30, please don't uh, wait for me. Please prioritize the 10.30 prep time. Um, and remember, the prep time meeting is extremely important so that your group can have a successful meeting. So first, I wanna talk about one of our priority bills, Senate Bill 397, advocating for removing barriers to expungement. I'd like to invite our community and coalition partner, Babak Zulfagari Azar, to share with you about the importance of the bill. Hey, Babak, are you there? Um, I wanna thank you so much for being here today because I know you're also double timing with uh, um, another lobby day today. Can you talk about the bill and what points folks should make in their meetings today? Absolutely, thank you, Christina. Appreciate you having me. I'll, I'll give a little context first. So Babak Sulfagari is our, I'm actually a family care manager with Portland OIC's Community Healing Initiative and a board member at Partnership for Safety and Justice. Um, and then Senate Bill 397 matters to me because I work with um, black community members here in Oregon who have criminal records and see the daily impact of the inequities that they face um, and the barriers that, that cause them to basically face never ending punishment for what they did in their past, right? Um, the, the current process just isn't working. Uh, people don't know where to start, who to talk to, how to pay for the fees associated with expungement, when to start the process, and why so long after returning to the community, they don't have the right to a fresh start. The data actually reveals that a small fraction of people ever start and finish the process, which really reveals more about the system of barriers and process and the person themselves. The current process is shame-based and fueled by a punishment model instead of one centered around internal motivation, personal accountability, healing, and a real opportunity to move forward with their lives in a meaningful way. Uh, the, the high cost and complicated process to seek expungement causes community-wide harm. The, the obvious harm is done to the individual who has a record. They're denied opportunities to move forward and prosper you know, they're told you can't live here with that on your record, or you can't work here uh, because you didn't pass your background check. You're not eligible for financial assistance because you're past convictions, right? For like school, for financial aid. Um, and then that harm extends to a person's family uh, and the community as a whole. Um, taxpayers are paying for uh, unemployment benefits and other public assistance. Uh, and if someone is able to earn a job with their record, they then earn less in wages and thus have less income to support their families, right? So these are all the domino effects with housing, employment, uh, and, and access to higher education, right? <clears throat> uh, in addition, you know, the, these limits in employment, um, education, housing opportunities box people in economically and, and force them into felony friendly jobs and into felony friendly neighborhoods. You know, something I always say is ask yourself, is this, even good for public safety, right? Is trapping people in poverty healthy for our society? Um, the strain and barriers negatively influence someone's chance to be a safe contributing neighbor in their community. Um, a record also changes the trajectory of people's lives, uh, especially young people. Uh, this is something that I see daily in the work that I do. Um, people think that once they serve their consequence, whether that's incarceration, whether it's parole probation, uh, that they can get a fresh start and move forward, right? And that's a false dream. As the reality of barriers uh, limits people's opportunities for emotional, educational, and employment advancement. Young people just aren't able to unlock their, their potential and are forced into a revolving door of poverty. It's essentially like a life sentence. Um, so some of the key pieces with Senate Bill 397, it's, it's really about removing these barriers, right? Um, creating better opportunities for access by automating the process for expungement, um, which really gives people hope. Uh, and, and then the, you know, this is tied into like poverty and economic inequities. And so, you know, removing the, the piece with 
fees associated with even applying for this, right? Um, or even getting involved is critical um, and accessing um, supports to help with the expansion process, critical. But then it's also decreasing the time that people have to wait, right? Um, and you know, you've got 10 to 20 years on so many of these different offenses. Um, so we're decreasing that time so that folks are able to um, sooner in their lives move forward um, and, and expunge this uh, record. Uh, and then you get into, in addition to that, um, you know, there's there's these loopholes and these tricks, right, within this process where, like, if you've had an arrest or police contact or if there was an acquittal on a charge that you had, like, those sorts of things uh, affect, right, these these correct disqualifiers, right, that then extend the time you got to wait, right? And so we've identified, you know, with this coalition I've been working with, Clean Slate Oregon, which is a bunch of leaders um, who are invested in this work throughout the whole state to really identify the different steps and the different checkpoints um, to where we can alleviate these barriers and give people real hope and, and an opportunity to move forward. So the key piece right now, we're, the stage of the game that we're at, folks need to reach out to legislators, right? We need to get involved with phone banking, reaching out to elected officials in their area to really urge them to support passing Senate Bill 397 so that together we can get this bill across the finish line. Thank you, Christina. Thanks, Babak. Before I let you go, um, folks, we're going to be asking them to do some phone banking on their own time, and they're also heading into legislator meetings. What would you say are the key talking points that folks should hit home on? Number one, let's give our community members a fresh start. Let's remove these barriers, right? Let's let's give folks a fresh, an opportunity for a fresh start. Um, and let's let's do this in a way that isn't we're, we're so stuck in the old school way of thinking with this right like it's 2021 like give folks an opportunity to get a fresh start move forward so that we can have safer community more thriving families um, and a, a better Oregon for everyone. That's Amazing. Thank you so much for your critical work on this life changing bill. Um, I know you got to go to. Uh, safety and justice lobby days. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Thank you so much, everyone. Blessings. Mm -hmm. um, so again, if you are meeting with Senator Przanski, your prep meeting starts at 1030. So it might be a good point right now for you to hop off of this main room and go look for your link to go to your prep meeting. But for everyone else, um, I want to talk about more ways you can support the expungement bill. I, I would like to invite you all to do some phone banking to let other like-minded Oregonians to know about the bill and encourage them to email their legislators. I totally understand that the idea of phone banking can be intimidating, but I encourage you to be open-minded as I walk you through how to do this at home and see if it's something that you might be open to. First, keep in mind that phone banking is the second most effective way to mobilize people. The first is canvassing, but you know, especially since we're virtual right now, phone banking is a great way to get people excited and to get the bill passed. For this specific phone bank, we have a list of 2,500 phone calls for you all to make. These numbers were acquired through the Oregon voter file, and these are folks who are identified as likely to be ACLU supporters. So you're essentially just talking to your friends. So, Another piece you can think about is if you're concerned about privacy and using your own phone number, you can use Google Voice as a way to grab another phone number that doesn't reveal your own. Once you grab, get people on the phone and you're chatting with them, don't give them a chance to say no. So don't ask, can I have a minute? Is this a good time? Just get straight to the point. The points again are what Bob Ack shared earlier about the bill. Ideally, these conversations are gonna be pretty straightforward because they're like-minded folks, but don't engage in a debate. And if you happen to get stuck in a conversation that is difficult, it is okay to hang up. And these conversations shouldn't last more than a few minutes, definitely not more than five because we've got plenty to go through. And then when possible, emphasize the human impact. You're not expected to be a data or numbers specialist or even a specialist on the bill. Talk about the human impact. So this phone bank, we've set it up to start today. You can do it while you're waiting for your meetings. You can do it later tonight. And it's also open all the way through 
next Friday. So you've got a week to invite your friends, your family to join you in phone banking. And it's also a great opportunity to also practice with your friends and family so you get comfortable with the talking points and talk on the phone. So let's dive in and I can show you how to get started. So a link will be dropped in the chat box right here that um, is open VPB. You'll click on that link. If you don't already have an account for phone banking, you can create one really easily. All you need is to include your first and last name and your email address. There's an option for a two-step security um, login, but that is not required. We recommend it, but again, it's not required. You just need your first and last name and email address. Thomas, can you go to the next slide, please? So this is what it looks like when you fill out your information. And then next slide. After logging in, the site will give you a really nice tutorial and I'll walk you through it as well. Um, here, you're gonna be able to see the person's information, who you're calling, a little bit of info if available about them. And then on the next slide, it'll show you that you have the script ready and available for you to read off the screen. So you don't need to shuffle around any papers or whatnot. If you happen to want to add more information or need to reference to something, you can use the one pager that's in the materials Google Doc Drive. Next, as you go through the conversation, there's one spot where you're gonna ask someone a question of yes or no. And it's gonna be asking folks about whether um, you can send an email form for them. And then below, you also have a spot to jot notes. So I'll pause here for the phone banking um, page and walk you through the email action alert that you're gonna be walking folks through. We can go to the next slide. So here's the email action alert. It lives on our website. First, obviously, I hope that you will fill it out yourselves. It is already pre-written um, out. You just have to fill out your information and it'll send it to your actual legislators. So while you're on the phone with folks, you can ask them if you, they'd be happy for you to fill it out for them. And that's great if that's the case, because that's one easy way to make sure that people have their voices heard. But if folks are more interested in just getting the link and doing it themselves, that's fine. Just direct them to the ACLU of Oregon's website at the link. And remember, only about 10% of calls will be answered when you're phone banking. So it's likely that you'll uh, end up clicking this button a lot. And it'll provide you some options that are shown on the next slide. Here are your most frequently um, options that you'll use. Not at home as if no one picks up. We won't be leaving any voicemail, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, refused is what you should use if someone never wants to be called again. It was a negative conversation. Um, you hopefully will not have to use that ever. And again, we're not leaving any voicemails. So really you should focus on um, not at home or um, maybe a disconnect if you hear that really fun noise in your ear. And then for the last step, and on the next slide, you just click this button and move on to the next call. That's all. So I hope you can uh, get excited about this Senate bill. I hope you have fun with it. Again, you can invite your friends. This phone bank is open from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. now through next Friday. So you've got lots of time um, to make some calls. And I will send out the link to this phone bank again as well after the program so you have it. So I hope you all will uh, get excited about that and take some time to make some calls. If you have any questions or concerns, you can always email me or email development at aclu-or.org for tech support. It's in the chat box. At this part of the program, we are going to set you free. We encourage you to use this time to review your talking points to prep for your legislator meetings. Please make sure you know where the Zoom link for that meeting is. If you need any help, you can email development at aclu-or.org. You can also, like I said, use this time to make phone banking calls. If you haven't already, make sure to fill out the three action alerts that are on our website that pertains to our priority bills. It's gonna take you a minute to fill out each one and it's such an easy way to have your voice heard. And finally, and most importantly, thank you so much to join for joining us 
for advocating for a better and more just Oregon. We have some more events virtually in the wings, so stay tuned for more opportunities to get involved. That said, we're always looking to improve and meet your needs. Please take a moment to fill out the survey to let us know how we did. I wanna also share a round of appreciations for all the people who made this event possible. Thank you to Julene Bahada from LS, LNS Captioning, and also for our ASL interpreters, Christina Healy and Elise Mungin. Thanks again to Janine Morales and Representative Ray Field for showing up and getting us grounded. And thank you to our fearless leader, Sandy Chung, for walking through such a digestible and meaningful budget training. And thanks to Babak for sharing such critical information on the expungement bill and making time for us today. I wanna to send a huge shout out to Thomas Ngo on the Brink Communications team for making the tech aspects of this run so smoothly. Also a big shout out to our lobby leads for ensuring that our legislator meetings run smoothly and also making sure that everyone feels prepared and ready. I have the deepest gratitude to my teammates at the ACLU of Oregon for all of your support in planning and executing this event from social media, scheduling meetings, editing, and being such great leaders. Lastly, I wanna thank you all for your engagement. I wish you good luck in your legislator meetings, phone banking, make sure to fill out those email action alerts and let us know how we did in the survey. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.